All right, welcome back. We're here for lecture 22, where we're going to be focusing on infectious arthritis and gout. To start with infectious arthritis, what's also called septic arthritis, uh, this is an infection essentially of the joint space. It's usually caused by skin flora, in other words, bacteria that normally live on the skin, uh, which primarily include staph and strep. Staph and strep normally live on the skin. Usually they don't cause significant problems unless they're able to get to a place where they don't normally exist. In this particular case, they're gaining access to the joint space, usually after some sort of injury or significant abrasion uh, or laceration to the skin. The bacteria uh, can also come from other locations and what's called seed the joint via the bloodstream. This is more common, to be honest, in kids, uh, but this is also a possibility for how the bacteria could get to that joint space. There could be an infectious, maybe in the heart valves, uh, what's called endocarditis, and this could actually shoot off little bits of bacteria that could land themselves within the joint and therefore be able to set up shop and be able to start multiplying and actually infecting that joint space. Usually the main findings in an infectious or septic arthritis are a red, hot, swollen joint with what's called micromotion tenderness. Micromotion tenderness, or MMT, essentially refers to any movement of this joint. Even just a couple of degrees causes really, really significant pain for the patient. So they do everything they can to avoid any movement whatsoever at that joint. They'll often even describe just on their drive over to the hospital that just the little bounces on the road, the tiny differences that the car is going over, can cause really significant pain within that joint. The picture that I have here, you may be asking, well, what does this have to do with infectious arthritis? This is actually because the first patient I ever had as a medical student, this was the diagnosis that they ultimately had. It was a college student who was part of ROTC, or the Reserve Officer Training Corps, who they'd been doing some training, running through the woods. He got a pre uh, pretty significant scratch over his knee, uh, and that actually allowed some of his normal skin floor to get into the knee space, set up shop, be able to multiply, and actually infect that joint space. So, I have a little bit of a personal affinity for septic arthritis just because it was the first patient that I ever saw uh, the diagnosis that ultimately he had had. Uh, some of the other findings that you may see in uh, infectious arthritis include fevers and chills. Any infection can certainly cause a fever, but often the chills here are described as rigors, very intense, whole body shaking, um, mainly because there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of chemicals that are being released by the inflammatory cells and the bacteria, and those all contribute to often very high fevers and these very significant chills. Some of the common bugs, as we mentioned, are the skin flora bug, staph, and strep. Uh, also common, actually, is gonorrhea, the sexually transmitted infection. This often occurs in what's called disseminated gonococcal infection. Usually what occurs here is somebody actually acquires the STI or STD, and after some time, the gonorrhea, if left untreated, is able to travel to other places in the body. As we mentioned, it may be able to seed joints. Uh, disseminated gonococcal infection usually is described as a migratory polyarthritis, that essentially we have different joints that are being affected, but it's migratory. It's moving from one joint to another to another. This is also seen actually in Lyme disease. Lyme disease, we all know the stereotypical bullseye rash that you may see, uh, but longer term, people with Lyme disease can end up with pretty significant joint pain. They often feel very significant fatigue. They actually may have some effects on their heart as well, leading to what's called heart block, uh, which is an abnormal normal heart rhythm. And actually, you see Lyme disease here as an example. It's what's referred to as a uh, spirilli bacteria. Essentially, it is spiral shaped. Uh, and the bacteria itself is called Borrelia burgdorferi. It was originally described in East Lyme, Connecticut, which is actually how Lyme disease gets its name. Tuberculosis may also cause septic arthritis. Now, this is not very common in the United States, uh, but it is certainly common in the developing world, as tuberculosis is more common uh, within the developing world in general. If left untreated, tuberculosis can cause problems not only in the lungs, which is where people most commonly think of tuberculosis, but in all honesty, anywhere uh, within the body, it can actually go and impact the spine in something called Pott's disease. Uh, it can impact the abdominal cavity, and certainly, as we're seeing here, it can go into other joint spaces. Uh, in addition to tuberculosis, we also will see often within the hand specifically, and that's the focus certainly of this class, the upper limb, that a very common bug that will cause uh, septic arthritis there is actually oral flora. And you can see certainly why here we have an adorable kitten, but those little bites that occur on the hand, if deep enough, can certainly allow some bacteria to seed within the joint and again set up shop and cause the septic arthritis. We may also see oral flora of humans 
which on the one hand may be the person's own oral flora. People actually who bite their nails or bite their cuticles can actually get septic arthritis from that. Now that's not common, um, but it is a possibility. More common than that if we're talking oral flora is often somebody who gets into, say, a fight and punches somebody and hits their mouth. Uh, in that case, again, we can get some seeding from the teeth of the person who was hit into the joint space of the person who was throwing the punch. The diagnosis of septic arthritis primarily starts actually with the history and physical, but if we do have suspicion of septic arthritis, we'll usually do a joint aspiration. We'll stick a needle into that joint, which, though it is certainly uncomfortable for the patient, we'll do everything we can to numb that particular area, and we do need to get some fluid to truly make this diagnosis. Usually the joint fluid that we uh, pull from that joint is turbid uh, or seems to have a lot of material in it. It's often very thick and viscous. Remember, synovial fluid itself actually has the texture of about egg whites. Here in septic arthritis, interestingly, while it's still thick, it's actually usually thinner than normal synovial fluid. And the reason for that is the uh, drawing in of these inflammatory cells releases, as we saw back in rheumatoid arthritis, a number of enzymes, which are actually somewhat digestive enzymes. They can start breaking down some of the proteins in the normal synovial fluid, which means that it still is relatively thick. There's a lot of bacteria in there which contribute to that thickness. But it's actually a little thinner than normal synovial fluid because it's been thinned out by the di uh, digestion of that protein. There may also be some blood within that joint fluid, and you see an example here of a joint aspirate uh, from septic arthritis. There's often many white blood cells. We'll usually look at the fluid here under a microscope and detect a lot of white blood cells on the order of sometimes 50 to 100,000 white blood cells per milliliter. And we'll usually do a gram stain. Gram stains essentially are used to differentiate different types of bacteria into gram positive and gram negative. They have a different coloration with this particular stain uh, under a microscope. And we'll usually do a culture as well of the fluid trying to grow out a particular bacteria. The reason for this is usually with therapy, as we'll see, we start with empiric antibiotics. Empiric antibiotics are used to essentially treat pretty much any bacteria that we think may be causing this particular disease or this particular infection. But over time, we want to be able to narrow that therapy. Using just antibiotics that cover everything is generally not good for a patient. It's going to kill a lot of their normal flora. Uh, it can disturb the GI tract, certainly, and it's leading you to potentially more significant side effects. If we can narrow that therapy to really be targeting just the specific organism that's there after we've cultured it out, which takes a couple days, then it's going to help to reduce those potential side effects and often make it so that we don't have as much GI uh, distress or destruction of the normal flora on that person. For the treatment, as we said, uh, in, addition to that, uh, in addition to those empiric antibiotics, we'll usually do a serial drainage of the joint, pulling out that fluid as it accumulates, pulling out the infection essentially as best we can. We may have to do surgical debridement if there's pretty significant destruction of the joint or the formation of what are called loculations. Loculations would be essentially uh, where we have scar tissue forming, loculation, scar tissue forming uh, within that fluid because of all the inflammation. There's a lot of loculations. We really need to be able to clear that all out, and drainage isn't going to allow us to get into all those separate pockets uh, of pus, essentially. And antibiotics, 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 as we said. Empiric antibiotics are what we'll start with, those general antibiotics that cover pretty much every possible organism that would be causing septic arthritis. But over time, as we said, uh, as we narrow down what the possible bugs are, as we culture them out and identify what the actual bacteria is within the joint, we'll reduce the antibiotics to just the one that treats that particular uh, bacteria. And of course, pain relief. As we said, this is very, very uncomfortable for patients. There is a lot of pain associated with septic arthritis. So we'll do everything that we can to, again, reduce that inflammation and give the person good pain relief. So that's septic arthritis. Let's take a look at gout now. Gout is the deposition of monosodium urate crystals. This comes from something called uric acid. And uric acid is actually created from the breakdown of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are the uh, structural backbone of DNA and RNA, which you may, uh, may remember back are what carries our genes and is able to be used to transcribe and translate those genes into functional proteins. Uric acid, again, is a breakdown product of those purines in particular from these nucleic acids. Uh, and when it deposits into these joints, it usually couples with a sodium atom creating these monosodium urate crystals. In particular, they like to deposit in the joints, in the skin, and in the kidneys. 
Gout is caused by overproduction in only about 10% of patients or under secretion in the remaining 90% of uric acid. Essentially here, somebody may have additional turnover of cells, which means more DNA is being released, ultimately digested, broken down, and turned into uric acid. That would be an overproduction, but that's really the minority of cases. Usually the person here may be producing uric acid at a normal rate, but their body just has difficulty getting rid of it, in particular in the kidneys, so it starts to build up in the bloodstream and is able to start depositing again into those joints, skin, and kidneys. Uh, in particular, people will get gout attacks where they get very significant pain, and we'll look at where that occurs on the next slide, but usually it's associated uh, with being after a large meal or alcohol consumption. As we'll see in a little bit, there are a number of dietary triggers that can cause a gout attack. In particular, these are foods that contain large numbers of purines, which again are broken down into this uric acid. Purines are a specific type of nucleotide or nucleic acid that exists in DNA and RNA. Uh, for alcohol consumption, the reason actually here is because alcohol inhibits the release of uh, uric acid into the urine and means that, again, it's going to continue building up. Alcohol essentially competes with the transporters in the kidney that are used to allow uh, uric acid to get out of the bloodstream and into the urine. The presentation of gout most commonly occurs within the big toe, what's called uh, pedagra. It can affect any joint, but this is really the classic presentation. There's also a, a classic painting by James Gilroy called The Gout. Uh, gout was a very common thing, actually, in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, in particular in wealthier populations. And we'll look at why that is. Uh, it mainly actually has to do with the dietary triggers. And this representation is commonly uh, depicted. It's showing extreme pain, essentially, within the metatarsophalangeal joint, which is the equivalent to the metacarpophalangeal joint of the hand, metatarsophalangeal being in the foot instead. Uh, and you can see the redness, the swelling. They're clearly showing you significant pain. Actually, Ben Franklin uh, is well known to have had gout and wrote a number of essays on the significant pain of gout and actually personified gout in a particular example where he's basically talking with gout and talking about how awful the actual disease is. Uh, here's an example that's not a painting, but an actual person. And you can see, again, we have that redness and swelling and presumably a lot of discomfort at this metatarsophalangeal joint. The pain in gout is so significant that patients will often say even just having a sheet over that big toe, a sheet that they're trying to sleep under at night, is so significantly painful they just can't do it. Any motion to that toe, anything that disturbs that joint, essentially they may say it feels like shards of glass are depositing in that joint. and to be honest, they're not all that wrong. As we'll see, there are crystals depositing here, and we'll see what those look like under a microscope. The presentation, again, most commonly are these attacks, but longer term, somebody may show these tophi, uh, in particular over the olecranon bursa. The olecranon, remember, is that proximal po uh, most portion of the ulna where it interdigitates with the distal portion of the humerus. Uh, in particular, overlying the olecranon bursa, we may see these big tophi over the Achilles tendon. On the ears are also a common location. And these tophi are basically big deposits of monosodi monosodium urate crystals within the skin and soft tissues. People with gout also may get kidney stones, uh, particularly in the overproducers. Again, that's going to be uric acid depositing and precipitating within the kidney to form a stone. It's more common in overproducers, mainly because under excretors, the whole problem is that they're not able to get uric acid into the urine, so it's unlikely that it's going to precipitate there. But for overproducers, where they're producing large amounts of uric acid, that gets into the kidney and it can start precipitating, creating that stone. We mentioned before that gout is often triggered by diet. In particular, some of the foods that can lead to one of these gout attacks include red meat, shellfish, organ meats, mushrooms and asparagus, dried beans, alcohol, in particular beer and wine. Now remember, for alcohol, it's not so much because it has excessive purines, which is the case with these other foods, but more because it's uh, inhibiting the transporters or competing for the transporters that uric acid also uses to get into the urine from the bloodstream. Uh, and this is also why gout was historically associated with the wealthy. You can see the foods that are listed here, and certainly in the past, uh, organ meats, shellfish, some of these more decadent consider, uh, considered foods, large amounts of wine. These are all things that certainly the wealthier population was able to get better access to. Uh, so it was often, again, thought of as a disease of the wealthy, in particular, wealthy men. 
So the diagnosis of gout and its treatment primarily are based off of doing another joint aspiration. We saw that for septic arthritis. Here when we do that joint aspiration, we do certainly see white blood cells and inflammation, but the primary finding that we're looking for are these needle-shaped crystals. They're yellow under polarized light. Now, polarized light essentially is taking all the possible directions of light and basically lining them up. Light waves are made up of uh, electromagnetic waves, and we won't start discussing physics in detail here, but essentially lining up those electromagnetic waves allows us to polarize light. You may be more familiar with this from sunglasses if you own polarized lenses and sunglasses. Uh, under polarized light, again, the gout crystals, the monosodium urate crystals, end up with this yellow appearance. For the treatment of gout in particular, we use uh, NSAIDs or colchicine in the acute environment, using again those anti-inflammatories for pain control. Colchicine actually inhibits white blood cells from being able to move, and it comes from this plant here. Um, it's something that in the past actually was very inexpensive, but actually because of a, a law within the United States, it's been picked up by a company and actually patented. It's now actually a very expensive medication and not used as frequently as it was in the past. It's actually because of what's uh, called the orphan drug law. Uh, the long-term treatment of gout primarily focuses on changes in diet. We discussed those dietary triggers before. But allopurinol, which is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, xanthine oxidase being the chemical that essentially creates uh, the uh, uric acid from those nucleotides that we mentioned before, if we inhibit that xanthine oxidase, it's going to prevent us from producing that uric acid. Also, uric uh, medications like probenicid, which you may have heard of, uh, help to reduce the amount of uh, uric acid that's in the blood by promoting its excretion into the urine. But uricose urics do, of course, carry with themselves the risk of producing kidney stones. If we're increasing the amount of uric acid in the urine, it can again start to precipitate and form kidney stones, even if we're reducing the amount of uric acid that's in the blood otherwise. So that's it for septic arthritis and gout. In the next lecture, we're going to turn our attention instead to uh, some connective tissue diseases, in particular, Dipuitrain's contracture, Dicurvain tendinitis, and trigger finger.